Hello everybody and welcome to a, yet another Room Rumble. It's good to see you all and, and hope you can join me for a, another ride on the Theist roller coaster. This time we're going to Father Charles, who I've had really good interactions with, seems like a good guy. Um, Christian, who was there, seems like a good guy. Really everyone was great except for one real notable exception and that's the um P Town. And and I promised P Town I would make this and so this one's this one's for P Town. Um why have I got a problem? And I must admit when I did go in, I, I did do a couple of jabs at him. And it was because I was frustrated. On reflection I, I now realise why I'm frustrated and that's because P Town I've always been as supportive as possible. When he originally hit the scene, people were like he's faking they call him Poe Town. I don't. I, I don't think he's lying. I don't think he's playing it up. If if he is, then you know I'm I'm naive, and that's that's fine. It says a lot more about someone tricking me. But I don't think he is, and and I still don't think he is. But he doesn't give me the same respect, and that's that's the problem. Um, so he's basically um, apologized for telling me that I believed in in God and. Uh, putting words into my mouth and misrepresenting me and, and sort of saying I'm only doing it for um, for the money and for the, my channel kind of thing. He apologised for that. Um, and then, you know, he goes on and he says this. When you have, I deal with atheists all the time. And let's, I'm just going to tell you whether or not they realise it or not, they're on the enemy's team, Okay. Whether, you know, Mark Reed's an example. I'll, I'll rebuke him and I'm more aggressive with him the most because I, I, I put him at a higher standard. But he will wooze you and then hammer you. Okay. He is, once the motives become not seeking truth and learning about the Bible and just being an atheist towards Satan's agenda or to get views on your channel or whatever, right? I mean, yep. you'll be surprised right now someone's going to clip this. From some ch someone, and they're going to make a little atheist substream, right? I mean, it's so yeah. He's still, um, still basically saying my only motivations are just to, to uh, do Satan's work or, or or get clicks, and um, it, it's really discouraging to hear somebody that you supported and sort of said no, um, give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, basically telling me my motivations and um that that did upset me um now i don't want anyone to go after p-town i don't want you to hassle him i don't want anybody to be you know i, I don't need anybody going at p-town or thing but i'm just giving you the reason why i don't really want to interact with him anymore that that i think there's better people like father charles and christian and even dustin um who i've had run-ins in the past he was uh, dustin buck he was he was really good tonight. Asked some really good questions, had some back and forth, just a really good interaction. So, you know, there's other theists I can talk to who won't accuse me of getting views and won't accuse me of, you know, working for the devil kind of thing. I, I don't need that. I don't need that. Um, what I think the problem is, and I'll, I'll give my point of view, I, I don't know this for sure. I don't know P-Town's mind. I don't know why he's carrying on like this. I think... It seems like to me that he gives these really bad evidences, like, you know, the famous, the sun is kind of the same size, you know, as the moon in an eclipse, so therefore God, you know, that, that kind of really bad evidence. And um, when you get into tough questions, like none of this is easy questions. All of it is, you know, the problem of evil, the the... Um, where does morality come from? Um, where does the universe come from? They're all incredibly complex and hard, but I feel like um, as soon as you get into those hard questions, P-Town gets frustrated and he doesn't want to get into the hard discussions. And that's okay. I, I can't force him. But don't make excuses to what other people are doing. Don't tell people, oh, you're just turning on me or something like that. That isn't what's happening here. Um, and I kind of... Um, I, I refute that that is what I am doing just because I ask difficult questions that people like P-Town maybe don't want to answer. And that's the other thing that sort of concerns me. Um, when I, I, I interviewed P-Town on my channel, um, it, is, it is on my channel and I've talked to P-Town a lot. And 
Um, some of his personal life he doesn't want to get into. He says, oh, I'd rather not talk about this or talk about that. And I've always respected that. He kind of pestered me on my life today. And, and I, I feel like, um, you know, that that's kind of something I, you know, had nothing to do with what we were talking about. So, yeah, I, I think I think um, I, I don't, you know, I don't really want to engage with P10 anymore. I'd rather engage in someone in good faith um, and show me the respect that I'm showing somebody for saying, hey, um, you know, I, I think you believe what you, you're saying you believe. And I'm not attributing motivations besides you believe it and are advocating for what you believe. I, I, I mean, I could run around saying, hey, this person runs a channel because they just want clicks and view, and that person is just trying to do this and that and the other. I generally don't. I generally don't. So, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, my time in the P-Town is done and I don't really want to discuss anything else with him. Um, he keeps saying he apologised, but how can you take an apology serious when he does it again? Again, I want to reiterate, I don't want anyone to bother him. I wish him the best. I hope that he finds everything he needs to from, from his faith or wherever he finds it. I just have better things to do than engage in a petty squabble over what my motivations are and how my tiny, insignificant channel is trying to, you know, rule the world or something. I really don't know. But... um. Yeah, apart from that, it's quite an interesting discussion, actually, and quite interesting about uh, Christian's um, theology and what he believes. Um, I, I've thought about it a lot since I've talked to him, and, and um, I, I think there's some problems with it. I think there's some issues there, um, but um, I, 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 I really want to make some time to talk to him again. But, you know, while we're here, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me, and let's get ready to rumble. Well, I just Where'd the water to... come from? Well, the Bible says it came from the, uh, yeah, it came from under, you know, it came from under the crust and, and then it receded and it, and, and it went back to where it came from. And well, also I... it was suspended in the sky. And it's the whole okay, story is crazy. Let me welcome Mark real quick. I, Mark, I just, I, let... so, sorry to interrupt. I, I just wanted to sort of add something that Peyton, you were sort of saying it's a slippery slope and that's literally a logical fallacy. Um, Everybody, no matter who they are, takes some stuff out of the Bible as metaphor or, or hyperbole. It doesn't matter who they are because, like, the Bible says that the, there's four corners of the earth. So unless you think there's literally the earth is like a square thing, then it, it's impossible not to take at least at least some things as poetic and and sort of hyperbole kind of thing, right? Correct, yes. So I, I don't see why if you say, well, four corners is just, you know, poetic language to sort of say um, 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 sort of, you know, the ends of the earth, if you will, the, the, the far reaching places of the, the planet, um, why that's not a slippery slope, but sort of Christians saying, hey, um, the flood covering the earth may be poetic or hyperbole. Um, all of the earth kind of thing. And that is a slippery slope. I don't get that. So maybe you can explain that. I just think that at some point, just like in everything, there are certain lines that need to be drawn. I mean, um, when it starts to contradict scripture is where I, I, you know, is where I take a stand. But that's up I to mean, interpretation. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. But again, I want, I wanted to preface though, before Mark Reed, um, because I, I, I want to go back to how, like, honestly, the, the electronic world that we live in kind of changes things. But typically in the, in the real world, this is a conversation that I would have with Christian like, privately. And it wouldn't be necessarily exposed to atheists because it's not a prerequisite to being a Christian. And the amount of faith that you have to have to be a young earth creationist in this world is... I mean, ultimately, I believe in miracles, you know, and I believe in a giant opposition. And we're talking um, something that just, like, like I said, we, we both weren't young. I mean, I wasn't a young earth creationist before I became a Christian. I, was, I mean, it was year. It took a couple of years, you know, two, three, four years after becoming a Christian where I now have this position. 
But anyway, I'm just rambling. No, no, that's, I mean, I, I, I really don't want it to get contentious. I know me and Dustin got a little bit heated and me and you got a little bit heated. I have no interest in arguing, you know, it, it makes no difference to me what you guys believe as far as that goes. Like, like I said, my first priority is to the scriptures and my second priority is to understanding what's going on in the world. So my priorities are upside down already in the light of secular people. So if I opened the Bible tomorrow and it said the world's 6,000 years old, I would believe it. In, in the opposition of all evidence, I would believe it. The problem is I just don't think it says that. I think that people put that in there, but it's not actually in there. I, I find that kind of, uh, you know, odd that, that you'd sort of, even if we had um, sort of overwhelming evidence that, that, you know, sort of indisputable evidence that you would sort of believe a, a book over sort of what, what, what we find in the real world. Um, I, I find I find young earth creationism sort of really baffling in that way because you can't you can't change the the um, radiometric decay of of elements like you sort of you know argon to potassium and things like that and and the the heat released that there is not enough time to deal with the heat that would be released over the radioactive decay of all of these elements. Um, I think it was uh, Creation Ministries had the heat, uh, the heat project. I think the rate project. I'm sorry, the rate project that sort of tried to find an answer to that, and they they simply couldn't. You know, so it's kind of this this well, it's a problem, but we're going to rely on some answer that's sort of um, yet unknown to solve it, which is a really weird position to take. Well, that's, you know, that's one reason I wanted to say that was because I, I'm of the opinion that the Bible is not against these natural scientific disciplines. I don't accept that. Uh, there are a lot of people, especially YEC proponents, who certainly seem to believe that. But yes. Mark, I don't know if you were here for the beginning of the conversation. But uh, no, I wasn't. I just, just got here. I'm sorry. Okay. So basically what this is, I was requested to talk about my ideas on biology and creationism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much me and you touched on this when we were speaking, but as you know, I'm, I'm a big admirer of Richard Dawkins and the work that he does and things like that. And so sure. I love, I love to, uh, to think about this kind of stuff. I, I love to consider the, the changing morphological world and the adapting mm. world. And I, you know, as a Christian, I interpret that as a much better kind of design, than a stale design that can adapt. So I think that the reason that the categories of life created in Genesis were so broad and so ambiguous is because God was accounting for adaptive morphology. To me, that's very obvious. You know, uh, someone like Kent Hovind, and I hate to keep pointing him out. I shouldn't use anybody, but someone that 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 is that strong in the YEC community and that dogmatic will use phrases like giraffe kind or fox squirrel kind or tuna fish kind, which are way too specific and not at all representative of the very general kinds of life that are mentioned in Genesis. So even from a very fundamental. Uh, old-fashioned Christian point of view, that is a misrepresentation of the scriptures that causes believers to come into conflict with the natural sciences where it is not necessary. Right. But, um, I mean, th there's some things that in, in the Bible that just uh, it sort of, if, if you do take um, genetics and um, sort of evolution to be accurate, it can't be true, like the Adam and Eve story. Um if if you trace back the genetic lineages of of humans, that they do not arrive at at sort of one man and one woman, um, e even even tens of thousands of years ago, they they don't arrive at that conclusion. So I, I I unless you're sort of saying that the Adam and Eve story was sort of metaphor, then that the science definitely doesn't agree with the sort of origin place of just just say humans, for instance. No, I mean, there, there certainly are. If a person, uh, for instance, is, is just a, a pure Darwinian or neo-Darwinian, they're going to come in conflict with the scriptures. The, the scriptures inherently are creationist. I, I don't think they are inherently young earth creationist or old earth creationist for that matter. I don't think that they're really all that specific, but they are inherently creationist. Now, one of the examples I gave, and you may find this interesting, Mark, I'm not sure, but one of the examples I gave about God's creative abilities in my interpretation is, is with the island of Hawaii, the islands of Hawaii, and the way that we know how they came into existence. You know, Big Bad Mama posted a bunch of specifics, but they're volcanic islands yeah. on fault volcanic. lines. You know, yeah. we, we know how they came into existence. And so yeah. they're fairly recent things in nature considering. 
-hmm. and they're still growing today. I used to live in Hawaii. We'd go play with the lava rocks, and every now and then the volcano would erupt, and people would go look at it. So those islands are still being formed today, and we know how they were formed. Now, I make the argument that God still made them, and God still deserves the glory for making them, and we simply have a bit of insight into how he did that. So if you look at the book of Genesis when it speaks of God creating things, people tend to want to snap their fingers and say, poof, but I just don't feel that that's necessary. I think that that is a placeholder for a process that he used to create things. To me, that okay. seems to be the case. So you're sort of saying that he created the processes that that then have created everything. That um, so, so Everything might be a bit of an extrapolation. I don't have a hard position on that, but it okay. does seem to be that uh, – those processes that we observe today, you know, another example of this obviously is, you know, with artificial selection, you know, we take, you know, things like maize or tiacente and we, we create corn, we bring corn into existence through successive generations. Yeah. You know? It was maize. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you look at that, do we still say that God created corn or that man created corn? We would say that man created corn. Sure. Man, corn did not exist before man. But we also know the process through which man created corn. And with man being made in God's image, I believe, such as the Hawaiian Islands, we get a bit of insight into God's creative processes. Okay. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I certainly can't sort of say, hey, I know definitively that, that a God isn't... Um, sort of hasn't created the processes um I, I i mean i don't see a cause for a god behind these processes i don't see any reason why a god has to start them it's it's just it's enough for me that there's natural processes and you would have to to show that a god in some way created those those processes but um it's not like i can say hey that you know the fact that evolution's there disproves a god because it, it just doesn't you know, it just, it just well, that's doesn't. kind of my position. It really has nothing to say about that one way or the other, in my opinion. The idea yeah. of there being supernatural creative force that brought all this into existence is a bit detached from the existence itself. You know, that's always been my position. You know, no matter what we did or did not discover about the laws of physics or the laws of nature, I really don't think that has all that much bearing on whether or not there was an intelligence behind them in the beginning. I just think those two disconnected thoughts. Well, yeah, I mean, sure. Like, I, I get what you're saying. Um, but it, it's sort of really what, what I want to focus on is going to something like the, the Adam and Eve story in the Bible kind of thing. Um, so um, that, that was the original question, whether, whether that story is in fact, it, whether it's metaphorically true by your, your standard or whether it is literally true. And that's an important distinction because while one sort of is, well, if it's metaphorically true, it, you, you can match it to almost any sort of scientific discovery and scientific evaluation, that's fine. If, it, if, it's, metaphor, if it's literally true, then um, the, the way that we, like it do, just does not mesh with our understanding of genetics, where humans came from and all of, all of these scientific fields. So really what I'm asking you is whether, whether that is like a literal story or a metaphorical story and what that means for you. No, that's, that's a good question. That's probably the question a lot of folks have been wanting to ask me all night, Mark, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, I'll tell you this. It's a bigger question than, than I think that we realize because in the, in the book of Genesis when it speaks about the creation of man – that idea of man is taken for granted that this is what they meant. I have quite a bit of theological belief that, that counteracts that. You know, Jesus, for instance, said that he was in the image of sinful flesh, and he spoke of another image. And there's sort of this uh, thing that exists throughout the scriptures where you see this fallen image that we call man— and then as a contrast, you see the true man that was created in the image of God, which we see, of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration and at the end of the book of Revelation coming back to light, whereas all of this has simply been actually in one place the image of the beast, but in one place the image of sinful flesh. So this, no doubt, is a beast. But the, the man that God created and the man that we're getting back to and the man that was seen on Transfiguration is not a beast. So it really depends on what we mean when we say man. Okay, um, so uh, it's sort of what I'm picking up there is is sort of 
earlier versions of man like you're talking about the the early hominids kind of thing like going back to them. no no that's that's actually no i might have been a little bit unclear i apologize well i'm just trying to sort of filter in what you mean by big because um what what usually people are talking about when they're talking about a beast is is usually sort of metaphorical it's usually some sort of um i mean we are classified as animals there, there's no there's no sort of classification um that that sort of says hey you you know when, when you classify an animal humans fall exactly into that classification so when when you say beast i'm not sure whether you're talking about an, an animal or whether you're talking about something else Okay, so what I meant by that, that's why I say I, I get so used to talking to people that are sort of in my bubble that a lot of times, you know how you get in an echo chamber, you don't specify. I've got oh, that's okay. Time. That's all right. I, I just would like to understand what you mean by oh, sure, beast. Because, sure. um, you know, we talk about beastly and people sort of acting in a, in a beastly way. I, I would understand that, you know, they're if you're using it as sort of a religious context to meet someone who is sinful and, you know, subject to their primal urges, I, I get that as a metaphor, but but I'm not sure I understand um literally what you mean well this like the body that you and i are wearing you know i don't know you probably wouldn't acknowledge that you're wearing it because you don't believe in spirits but in my terminology the body that you and i are wearing is for all intents and purposes an animal i mean when carlos linnaeus went to to do taxonomy and classify things right. he was very disappointed that he had to classify man as an ape he did not want to do that as you know he was a creationist yes. and an adamant bible believer and so he had to basically consign himself to being intellectually honest and saying, look, I don't have a choice but to classify man with the other great apes because the system that I have developed to classify everything does that with or without me. Sure. So opposable thumbs, hip joints, you know the whole story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he classified man as a great ape because the system that was developed to classify animals did that on its own. Now – when we're speaking of the creation of man, there are, I don't have all the information in front of me, so I'm just going to ask the audience to bear with me so I can come back to answer questions because I didn't come with all this in mind. But there are scriptures in the book of Genesis that identify a beast of the field, and in the context, you can tell that it's speaking of a human being. So Jesus said certain things, and there, there's numbers of things said throughout the scripture, skip, 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 to give us the idea that what we are seeing here is a very cheap imitation of the image of God. That this is an animal, this is a beast, this is not made in God's image, not at all. And mm. that there is another image, there's another body, there's another form, which does not share relation with the animal kingdom, which cannot be classified with the animal kingdom, which is a glorified form that this is an imitation of. It's got two arms, it's got two legs, etc. but it is a glorified form, which this is an imitation of. So I wrote a book one time, Mark, somebody had brought it up earlier, I wrote a book one time called The Image of His Son, which is a book where I talked about Darwinian theory and how it connects to Paul the Apostle's teachings. And in that book, I made a very controversial statement and took a very controversial position, which I hold to this day, which is that in Genesis, when it says, let us make man in our image, that our, that us, was Christ and Lucifer. And so you see the, the glorified image, the thing that Adam was before the fall, the thing that Jesus was on transfiguration, the thing that all of us are prophesied to be in the end, that that was the true image of God. And it was a body. It was physical, but it was a glorified physical in the same way that New Jerusalem is a glorified physical realm. Whereas Lucifer molded and shaped through, uh, for lack of a better term, animal man, another image, which is the image that Jesus called the image of sin and death, the image of fallen man. And so we see these two things, one the image of God and one the imitation. And when Adam fell from glory, no doubt he took upon himself animal skins, which is to say this cheap imitation. Okay, so... so Is Father Chuck okay? Well, I, I really I want to get back to the, the original question, whether the, the Garden of Eden was a literal story or a metaphorical story, because you sort of tangented out there um, to sort of, you know, and I get what you're saying, that that, that in, in your sort of worldview, yes, we, we have a fallen um, um, bodily and, and fleshly form and, and a spiritual form. But when, when you're talking about sort of, um the 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 fleshly form or the the you know the sort of um, um fallen man as you described it um you're really talking about the events in the garden of eden creating that that fallen form right that's essentially what you're talking about but 
Yes. So, Actually, it's both the fall of man and the fall of Lucifer simultaneously. Yes. Well, sure. Yeah. But more specifically, I'm looking at the Garden of Eden. So um, the, the eating of the apple from the tree of good and evil was the, the um, um, fall of man as far as the Garden of Eden is concerned. Um, and it was the only humans, as the Bible describes, was one man and one woman. But, uh, uh, you know, so what we understand from genetics, that sort of conflicts rather heavily. So what I'm asking sure. you sort of, and I'll ask you point blank, is it a metaphor? Is that story a metaphor or is it literal? Did those events in fact take place or did they not take place? Now, this this is a true dichotomy. Like they can't be both taking place and not taking place at the same time. So sure. what, what I want to know is whether the the events in described or better yet here's a better one at that time in the garden of eden whether it's metaphorical or literal did there exist only one man and one woman in in the world okay let me answer that question because that's a very direct question right. and that's a, a good way that you phrased the question as well so this really does tie in to what i was laying out with the two different versions of what we call man the story of the garden of eden is about the glorified man, the man that is made in the image of God. It is not about this beast that you and I are testing and genetically proving and, and tracing back. That story is not about the body that you and I are in right now. This body is an animal. That story is about the image of God. So our testing and our measuring and our scientific processes are here to study this thing that we call man, which is actually a beast. It has nothing to do with the man that God created in his image. Does that make sense? So, so what I'm getting you, if you look at it in, in a very literal way, there were more humans than just Adam and Eve, but they weren't the um, sort of um, um, glorified humans. They were the, the beastly humans, if you will, is, is what you're saying. Well, people have proposed that genus Homo and genus Australopithecus share a common ancestor. I know you probably. Yes, that. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are. There are even uh, some old earth creationists that also believe that. Well, basically, the gist of that way of thinking is that genus Homo is an animal that was modernized from genus Australopithecus. Well, the way that I understand this, and it's I don't really have all of my notes together, Mark, because I wasn't expecting you to come on the stream, which I should have. <laughs> no, been no, that's before. fine. I'm I'm sorry. I do apologize. I, no, to be no, honest no, with no. you, the only reason I'm here is to to hear P Town rebuke me again is the only reason I'm here. Well, let me, one more thing here. So yeah, it's my belief that take a fight at, again, huh? it's my belief that at the fall from the garden, Adam and Eve were robed in this right here, which had been being prepared for them by the foreknowledge of God, knowing that they were to fall. Now, sorry. Could you run that by me one more time? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I yes. sort of... It's my belief that, uh, what you and I call man yes. was being being modernized, being developed, being prepared, because the foreknowledge of God was aware that Adam and Eve would fall from that glorified position, and he had to have a robe of flesh to robe them in when they did fall. So their fall came right at the time that this robe of flesh was ready for them. Okay, so he's basically, so so you're trying to sort of say, and, and do, do tell me if I, I'm a sort of, Mis misrepresent you in any of this that that um adam and eve were more like spiritual beings that were put into the already pre-existing um beasts if you will as as you've sort of described them that were the physical human lineage kind of thing is that is that what you're trying to say that's very close what i'm okay. saying see i i am a special creationist a lot of folks don't seem to know that about me though i say it all the time but I am a special creationist. I believe in especially created categories of life. But I believe that what we are calling um, man does fit into that beast of the field category with Australopithecus. And that the glorified body that Adam and Eve fell from, that they were taken out of that glorified state, which the book of Revelation calls white robes. And they were robed with this garment of sin. This uh, this animal skin that was that was uh, butchered for them, so to speak. They were robed in flesh. The, the blood was dripping. The, the way that it's termed in Genesis is very poetic. But I believe the foreknowledge of God had accounted 
that at the time that they were to be taken out of their celestial bodies, that this robe had to be prepared for them at that time. And the fall from the garden was not a physical transition in the sense that they went to a different physical location. I don't believe that. I believe that they entered into a different physical body. They left the image of God and their spirit came into this image, which I'm referring to as the beast of the field. Okay, so how how many of them were 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 sort of so I mean you you've referred to Australopithecines as as the beast kind of thing like the well, that's beast that's a bit of a broad category, right? Uh, okay, okay. So uh, I mean it, it's just it's just strange that we have sort of, you know, at no point did according to science at no point did Homo sapiens fall um below like about 6,000 members kind of thing. Um right. right. Um, there, there's no point that happened. So um, I'm trying to sort of pass what you mean by um, they were, were robed, because if in that case, there's only um, sort of a two humans, um, a, 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 as we understand modern humans today, and 5,898 beasts basically wandering around. So I'm, I'm wondering how that, that works. Well, that's really the same way that it works today. There are sons of God in the world today, and there are beasts, and they're all robed in the same skin. Uh, okay. All right. So maybe this is, yeah, okay, that, that's sort of a, 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 a bit weird, but sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how, how you, would, you would go about demonstrating that is the case. I'm... I'm um, but but in that way, sort of the Garden of Eden would have to be in some way metaphorical, the, the way that it's talking about it, correct? Well, it's just, it's dealing with glorified bodies. It's dealing with the image of God. Okay. It's not dealing with this. This is not what it's about. This is something that came about as a result of it. Okay. Well, I mean... The lineage, I, I... the lineage of this has nothing to do with the lineage of the sons of God. This is simply a dispensational thing that happens for a time and passes away. But when God created man, it wasn't this body. And when God receives man in the end, it will not be this body. So the study of this body is nothing more than the study of an animal. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, I, I, you're welcome to believe that. Um, I, I, I think I have some... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't think the Bible sort of... Um, I mean, I understand that's your interpretation of it, but you would have to admit that a literal reading of it wouldn't get you to that that kind of thing right that 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 I actually don't admit that i think okay. that there's enough scripture to cause us to see a difference with the fallen man and the original creation that this is the logical conclusion oh okay um actually i say this i think that it's people like the yec proponents that stir all of this up in such an unrealistic and unnecessary way that actually causes people not to see these kind of things because the subject becomes so taboo overall that people won't even allow their minds to broaden any to receive new information on the subject. And that's one of the reasons I want to do this broadcast because these kinds of blanket rejections of scientific disciplines and these kinds of taboo feelings that we have do nothing but limit us and limit our ability to understand things, whether they're natural or spiritual. And so a person should not live in fear of simply considering some information. You know what I mean? Yeah, so um yeah, so so it, it it's kind of um I I won't I won't disagree that sort of um religious thinking in some way of course I'm an atheist I'm going to believe that religious thinking can limit your understanding of how the world actually in fact works. Um I I can't really comment on this idea that um humans are, have somehow been transpositioned as sort of heavenly creatures into our bodies. I, I don't see any evidence for that, but if that's what you believe, that's what you believe. So really, if we're just studying the the fleshly forms, that that's great. Um, you know, you, you, you're basically saying, hey, the, the science, you know, you can rely on science to, to tell us about um, worldly things. But spiritual somewhere else. Um, I, I don't see any reason to believe that that is the case. I've never been demonstrated anything spiritual or or supernatural in any way. Um, and if you know, I, I certainly won't say, "Hey, you know, don't believe the Bible." That that's your choice. Absolutely. No, I get that. Um, but it's kind of odd um, how it's sort of 
references a lot of earthly things in in the garden like the the serpent and the the you know clothing that they put on them and um just just a lot of these things and eating and you know the, what what I want to know now is sort of why why do to these spiritual forms n need to do all of this? Why do they have earthly well, spiritual forms? That's I think spiritual forms is a bit of a misconception because people a lot of times when we talk about these kinds of things, people tend to think that I'm just speaking. You know, the word spiritual. Uh, I think people don't understand from a biblical point of view. That a spirit is not something you can touch or see or feel. You know, a spirit is not a thing. It's an ethereal force that exists in another dimension. So when we're speaking of a glorified body, we're speaking of something very much physical. You know, when you look at the book of Revelation, speaking of the serpent, the book of Revelation identifies the red dragon as the devil, the liar, the father of lies, and the serpent. It actually identifies the red dragon as the serpent from the Garden of Eden twice in the book of Revelation. So... The language, no doubt, is very poetic. I've always felt as though the language was very kindergarten, to be honest with you. I think the language in the Garden of Eden, and even in Genesis generally, but especially in the story of the Garden, is a very, very fundamental ABC first grade understanding of what was really going on. When it hey, says, Father Chuck, are you up? He's probably fell asleep. Yeah. Or Charles. Father Charles, are you okay? Okay, he's moving. Father Chuck. <laughs> you do not have to be here if you want to go to bed. Are you sleeping? <laughs> uh, you're on mute, mate. I you think you're on mute. mute. <laughs> I have a lot on my mind. It's uh no, it's been interesting. I'm, I'm I can multitask, so <laughs> I didn't know if I bored you to sleep or not. No, no. no <laughs> it was probably no. me. Bl look, blame the atheist. That, that's what I say. Blame the uh, atheist. Mark, 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 it's your fault, buddy. Yeah. You know it, and I just, I'm, I'm not going to put up with it. That's anymore. all right. All get right. get, get P-Town to rebuke me. <laughs> Apparently, he rebukes me okay. constantly. So, um, you Mark. know, get him to rebuke me again. What are you talking about, Mark? Oh, look, I was directed to a stream of yours where you were saying how much you rebuke me and that you know atheists and uh, it was it was quite a um it, look, I don't want to I don't want to spoil the stream but it was quite a sort of I, I dare I say boastful and and sort of you know puffed up oh I rebuke Mark Reed all the time and just just it, I I I had to laugh I laughed so hard I'm sorry I really did <laughs> That's hilarious <laughs> yeah, Mark, I rebuke you all the time too. I wear you out. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. what I what rebuke. I always say Re look, rebuke away. I, I found it hilarious. I, what I, just I love what it. I say over and over again is that for some strange reason, I hold you yeah. to a higher standard than all the other atheists I talk to. I don't know. And it's why. because I care about you, Mark. Okay. Because I don't like seeing you go in the wrong direction when your motive is purely to go onto a stream, pick a fight, and just. Have I picked a fight? Sure, the other way, seeking truth. Instead of seeking truth, then I point it out because um, I can see when you switch gears. It's the same thing I say all the time. Yeah, I yeah. Say it differently, slightly, but you should take and I and just like we talked last time, you should take it as a compliment. For some weird reason, I hold you to a higher standard. I don't know why. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit, but I don't like seeing you go down the wrong direction. I want I you kinda... to. Be I, I'm on that same page. I, I second P Town's uh, 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 motion on the floor. Well, I, I don't know what you mean by by switch gears. I mean, I don't make any pretense that I am um, an atheist, and I think that religions can be harmful, and that that sort of um, trying to convince people to pay attention to the science rather than um, outdated sort of dogma is is what I do. I've never made any kind of lie or pretense or thing about that. So I'm not sure what you mean by switching gears. Um, I think that you you sort of leveraged a well, you're only in it for the views kind of thing against me, which is sort of That's really a different topic. Well, yeah, it's a different topic, but it's you sort of time. You came in. Well, if, you if I could to talk, if I if I could talk, 
I've, I've never gone into a room wanting to pick a fight. I've always wanted to have discussions, and I think we've had productive <laughs> Why do I have a feeling that that's not true? You like to argue, well, and you've, you've said that multiple times, and that's okay. You know, I like to have okay. discourse, too. Well, I mean, you like this, how you've said it multiple times. Yeah, I, I feel like I can't, I can't speak without being sort of jumped over at the moment. Um, so, so I've got a perspective, and that that disagrees with a lot of the the Christian perspective. And I don't make any secret about that, but I really do enjoy the conversations about it. That's why why I'm doing this. Um, I've had really good conversations with C.J. Cox and Christian, and um, even you. I gave you a chance on my channel to come on, kind of thing. Um, and I think that I draw the line where people sort of go, well, you believe this and you believe that, like like you do to me. You tell me what I believe, not ask me what I believe. And I think that's presumptive and, and kind of a bit, a bit uh, it, it's incredibly rude, you know, to sort of say, hey, this is what you believe. This is what you know. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see well, why I have to subscribe to that. You do the same thing with me. And, and I try my How best so? to represent you. Meth methodological naturalism. Is what you're going to ascribe to? So well, how, how do I tell you like what that, you believe? Like, you all the time talk about what I believe because I believe the Bible, and well, you give me your interpretation of the Bible. No, I give okay, my yeah, interpretation. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, 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 anyway, well, anyway, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to gonna say me... a few things. No, I'm going to say a few things. First of all, if I thought uh, Mark was coming on my show uh just to start trouble mark wouldn't be invited to my show okay i have the highest respect for mark uh i think he's a man that just likes good conversation and that's why he's here so anyone accusing him of coming on my show for uh, uh views or uh picking fights just to pick fights uh that's ridiculous so i really don't want to hear about that anymore so if we're going to get on with a conversation, let's not get on. I mean, let's get on with a conversation and put aside this. Uh, I'm yeah. tired of the ridiculous. Right, right. You're it right. Was, it You're was right. one instance. It was one instance, and I apologized to him. And you know, it, it's a thing when you know in Christianity, Mark. It's there's an aspect called forgiveness. And mm -hmm. you should refriend me on Discord because all I try to do is I'm still looking for your Scientologist, and um, I've tried to refer a couple other streams that you would be interested in. Yeah, the, the, I think unless unless there's just an issue with Discord. Well, I don't know uh, Father it. Charles is right. Let Let's go back to the conversation. And I do apologize. That's my fault. Um, I, I guess I guess um, yeah, and 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 I, I guess I got to examine why why I'm a bit a bit uh, frustrated about about sort of what you've been saying lately. Not the time before when you're poly, but you continue to say it. But let's move on. Um, you're right, Father Charles, and and yeah, I guess I guess I did pick a fight in this one. So I suppose I'm just showing P Town to be correct. So um, yeah, let's get back to the conversation. And I want to. Um, it's just. It's just. Oh, it was. It's only sometimes when you switch gears. And again, I. I always say the same thing. For and it's a compliment to you, Mark, as I hold you to a higher standard than all the other atheists I talk to. And I. It doesn't mean to be offensive. Well, it's because I love you, and I want you. I want you to see the truth one day. I want you to be a Christian. I want you to be on our on the winning team. Yeah, let me hop back in for just a second. Brian. Yeah, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I do think it's good if we gravitate back to the original subject yeah, a yeah. little bit. Um, so the original subject was I was making the case that not only is it obvious that organisms change morphologically, but that the Bible does not say anything to make us believe that they don't, you know, contradictory. So, uh, are there any questions on the panel or in the chat? about biology, about, you know, the subject at hand? I have one. Logan, can you hear me? Yeah. Say uh, question, Logan? Yeah. Uh, do you believe animals have, share a common ancestor with each other, like uh, cats and dogs? I believe that animals in the same general kinds from Genesis share a common ancestor. So, like, for instance, in Genesis, it says that God created the fowl of the air, or you'd say the bird kind. I believe that birds share a common ancestor because they're of the same kind. It says that there is a creeping thing kind, and so I believe that creeping things, whatever that means or whatever's entailed in that, share a common ancestor. I am a special creationist 
back to those general categories of kind, which were very general and very broad. Can you well, ask a couple first, of quick questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Justin. Go ahead, Logan. Yeah, let me go ahead. Uh, uh, do you think birds share a common ancestor with dinosaurs? It would, it would appear as though there are species that are very bird-like and very reptilian, um, which seem to challenge Genesis's definition of kind. My take on that, Logan, is that there's, there's probably all sorts of kinds of animals or all sorts of variations of species which have gone completely extinct, which had they been here today would shed a bit more light on this. Like for instance, we didn't know for the majority of, of history since dinosaurs were discovered that uh, dromaeosaurs and some theropods generally had feathers. We know that now. And so the, if they had been here, if dromaeosaurs had persisted to this day, we would have known that all along. So I imagine there's quite a bit of information that has died with them that would shed light on some of those controversies. Do you think, you. Um, uh, uh, say, chimpanzees and humans had a common ancestor? No, I believe that it's very possible that uh, genus Homo and genus Australopithecus had a common ancestor, but I'd be mm. very hesitant to go further than that simply because of the, the account in Genesis seems to be fairly strict. So how would you sort of explain the genetic similarity between um, chimpanzees and humans and, and things like, um, you know, the chromosome 2 fusion point um, and, and things like um, endogenous retroviruses, which takes a lot to explain, but, I, I'm, you know, if you do I, want to know. Sorry? No, I'm somewhat familiar with those, so I'm, I understand okay. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so first and foremost, I would say I can't explain that. Uh, me being a creationist, I said this on one of the previous streams, you may not have been there, but mm. me being a creationist is a position of faith. You know, if, if I was absent of a position of faith, of course I would believe that. That's the obvious solution. You know, this is one of my disagreements with young earth creationists is that they deny that that's the obvious solution. If you are in a secular worldview and you are just simply following the evidence, then Darwinism to the nth degree is the obvious solution to not only biodiversity, but life generally. So, you know, when you get all the way back to abiogenesis, et cetera, once you get to the point of cell reproduction, then the Darwinian worldview is the obvious solution to all biodiversity. So when I say that I believe in special creation to the extent of especially created broad kinds of animals, that's an extremely faith-based position that does seem to fly in the face of a lot of the evidence. I'm of the opinion that there exists other information that would shed additional light on the evidence that would make the position look more reasonable. Yeah. But even that is a faith-based position. So I'm okay. acknowledging that the fact that I'm a special creationist to any capacity is a faith-based position. Oh, that that's fine. Um, and and I, I do have to correct you on one thing though. We don't. So when you sort of say Darwinism to to sort of somebody that knows about about evolution, you're sort of referring to a really, really old model of, of evolution, right? Like incredibly yes, old. Um, yes. And so um, what we're using at the moment is integrated synthesis, right? It's all of these different me mechanisms and all of these different things working in tandem. So um, it sort of so... so um, yeah, re referring to um, Darwinism to describe modern um, um, evolution is like referring to the steam engine to describe how jets today are powered. No, I understand you know, that. I, I only chose that terminology because in these young earth creationist circles that we're reaching out to, that's the terminology yeah. that they use. But of course, you're right about that. Yeah, and and so, and so in real quick? Sorry. yeah, sorry, go ahead. I think it might also be pertinent to the question you just asked. Do you think that all the kinds in the garden were all eukaryotes? Yes. So then how is that any different than just standard evolution theory? So at some point, they're eukaryotes that evolved into these different kinds in the garden. Well, that's that wasn't exactly the question that you asked me. What I'm saying is that the, the individually created kinds, bird, fish, beast, et cetera, uh, man to the natural degree, these were organisms that I do believe were especially created, whatever that means, and that when they came into existence, they had eukaryotic cells. That's what I mean. So, um, 
so how how would you sort of um get around um say the idea of of uh monotremes for instance what why do monotremes exist Remind me, of monotremes. Oh, oh, monotremes. sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry. I knew um, at one time. And I just don't. Remember. Yeah, it, it's echidnas and and platypus. They they lay eggs, yes. right? So, yes. okay. so I just want to sort of put this out there and explain the the way that that placental mammals and eutherians is what we are. We're, we're placental mammals, sort of developed. So you had a um s r s i r h family of of um retroviral elements that infected the germline way way back in the day and we know this because the um um the marsupials for instance kangaroos wallabies and things like that they have a version of that that retrovirus but not the the peg 10 or 11 so peg 10 or 11 is the placental part of that that retroviral element so um, marsupials don't have placentas. They have a pouch system, right? And then when you go sort of back further, the, the monotremes don't even have that SIRH um, retroviral element, right? They've got, they still lay eggs, just, just like reptiles do, or turtles, you know, uh, cheloids, um, chelonoids, sorry. Um, so sort of how how would you explain that in terms of um why marsupials don't have placentas and why um 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 monotremes don't have even sort of the 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 um um a, a free moving embryo like they they have a a an egg still um because it's it yeah. sort of it seems to be and and because we can narrow it down to that specific retroviral family, the SIRH family, we seem to be able to explain this really well under modern evolutionary the theory, under integrated synthesis. And I'm wondering how you would, like, what is the reason for that? Um, because I've talked to a lot of people that have sort of said, hey, um, if we didn't have the placental development, we would just die off or you know we wouldn't we wouldn't exist kind of thing and it's like well wait but there are animals that don't have that and i'm wondering yeah. how how you explain that no that that's a great question and honestly i'd, I'd forgotten what the word monotreme meant but it started to come back to me as you were mm. explaining it because this is a big one that people bring up obviously so i i explained at the beginning of the stream that i hold the position that life is highly malleable a lot yep. more so than, than creationists tend to accept right you right. know this about me already. Well, sure. when we're speaking of created kinds, our minds, and this actually harkens back to Logan's question about, uh, you know, dromaeosaurs and ancient birds, but mm. our minds typically like to organize those into reptile, mammal, etc. But that is actually not what Genesis says. And I think that it makes creationists very uncomfortable, the idea of crossing such such defined thresholds as that. But really... Even in the way that Genesis lays it out, it's so broad and so vague and so unspecific that I don't think you could make a scriptural case against the transition from reptile to mammal. I don't think you could. And I tend to be more liberal with my allowance for it because of the like what you're saying, that it's very obvious. So I, I still believe that you can hold an initially special creation position while still allowing quite a bit of malleability. I don't think the scriptures forbid, for instance, the crossing, uh, the adaptive crossing from something we would consider reptile to something we would consider mammal. Now, that's an extreme position, and I'm certainly in the minority of creationists who would say that. But what you're saying is not shocking to me at all. And, and I don't think the book of Genesis specifically excludes that kind of thing. Right. Um, no, I get that. Um, but um sort of i i guess i'm sort of comparing it with it, it's kind of odd the 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 whole kinds thing and i've i've found it very very um very fuzzy what people consider kinds and and you sort of said that you don't think humans and chimpanzees have common ancestors but we've well, got i want to say this i'm not saying that is a hard statement okay because i do believe that this is an animal it would not surprise me at all if I came to a position where I did believe that I'm just saying that as it sits right now, I don't feel inclined to believe that yeah. that would not be a sacrilegious position to me. 
if I did believe that because I don't consider this to be man. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, right. I got you. So, so man is the higher being that has been put in these fleshly forms. Is is sort of. I mean, don't let me or these beast beast form kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know how we would, um, how we would, uh, uh sort of integrate that into to sort of the the scientific understanding of, of evolution i you know if you want to say hey um um it, it it's it's just that we're examining the the sort of beast form without the the higher form i, I mean I, I don't know what to say to that but then well, I don't think it's really a scientific thing I, I think that young earth creationists are fundamentally shooting themselves in the foot because the understanding of the spiritual meanings from the stories in the old testament especially the stories from the torah have nothing to do with modern science. They're the ones trying to connect these dots. They're the ones who feel a desperate need to connect these spiritual lessons to something in the natural world. They're they're right. inserting that feel that it does not belong. Okay. Oh, look, you know, I, yes. yeah. I mean, if 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 you want to believe that, that that's cool. I I don't, you know, I I can't. I I just don't know. How would we go about investigating if that's the case? Like, what kind of investigation could we do to see if that is actually true or not well investigating in itself that kind of scrutiny that kind of skepticism is a scientific thing to do it's a it's a logical thing to do sure. the the scriptures are a position of authority whereas science is a position of investigation and and proving things beyond a reasonable doubt so people who have faith in the scriptures are having faith in the authority of the scriptures there's nothing to be investigated for those of us who believe that it was inspired divinely there's no investigation required. You're coming from a scientific perspective, so mm -hmm. it's natural that you want to investigate it. But that kind of inquiry kind of already misses the point of its authority. So then how do you know that these events actually happen, that there is a spiritual realm? That, that um... I have to object. Okay. Science is not about proof. Okay. He isn't wrong. It isn't really no, about right. proving. It's also not really much of an objection. Well, I, I, I sort of took the word as colloquial, you know, like uh, I, I guess you could replace it with how do we make a model of how this, this happened? How do yes. we... Well, that's what I mean by proof beyond... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. You're sort of using proof in a colloquial term. I sort of took that yes. for granted. And me and was... you, I don't know if you remember, but when me and you, when I was on your channel, me and you spent about 20 minutes talking about proof and what people mean when they use the word facts. Right, and right, things. right. It was brilliant. Really, listening to you talk about that was very brilliant. Well, I mean, yeah, you're not you're not wrong. I, I, I'm i sorry, I didn't catch who who spoke up. They're, they're not wrong. I'm, I'm sorry, who who yeah. was that that said that, that science doesn't? Justin. Justin, did you want to extrapolate on that? Thought, yeah, it please? doesn't prove things. You're right. Well, you're absolutely well, I, right. My only, my only thought was is that you use proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I would only, hmm. like, use a different term I would say falsibility, falsifiability, okay. right? So that it shows, it demonstrates the falsifiability of a, of a hypothesis, right? But it doesn't prove anything wrong. Well, let me let me clarify on that, and I'll sort of refer to to um, um, uh, Karl Popper, who did a lot of a lot of work on the philosophy of science kind of thing. Um, it doesn't prove things like overall, right? So you're not talking about a global proof kind of thing. Only maths and, and other sort of more abstract um, things have, have these global proofs. But he said you prove certain things within the discipline. So you might prove this to your satisfaction, sort of when it meets a certain criteria of evidence. But if you mean prove to mean... Um, if, if what you're talking about when you say proof is unquestionable um set in stone um results that cannot be questioned what Karl popper said is no science doesn't provide that everything's up for scrutiny and speculation and and able to be overwritten there is no solid proof as in like when you have maths and you do a proof that is unquestioningly um, a demonstration or it, it's it's set in stone that that can't be wrong it's a proof it's a mathematical proof yes, yes which science right. doesn't yeah, like have for example that out really. for example all proofs in physics have a mathematical uh, uh basis yeah well that's that's just a mathematical proof but, but what popper sort of said is that if you want to prove 
that, say, a bird flies south for the winter, a certain species flies south for the winter, that sort of local proof, it can be met, but it's always up for scrutiny and, and questioning. So he sort of did say that proofs can exist, but not the kind of global proof, you know, like we're talking about. So you're not wrong. You're, you're absolutely right, Dustin. You're absolutely 100% right. Um, yes, that, that's a good thing to point out, really. But but really what I'm trying to get at is is sort of, um, and, and I think I've sort of, I, I really want to talk to it in Christian, because I've kind of encountered this idea of, Things that either ontologically have happened or haven't. So it, when I, what I mean by ontologically, like I mean in reality, things have happened or they haven't happened. And and yes. really, what I want to know is how do I go about telling if this event has actually happened in reality or not in a way that's sort of reliable and rigorous, not necessarily scientific, but how do I? Um, have an epistemology that justifies that through a reliable process and and a lot of it i get you know you sort of say faith and to me that's sort of believing it without that justification which is is really hard for me to do like i won't no. i won't lie that that's incredibly hard for me to do well i don't mean to say it like that i mean obviously there's okay. a degree of that required, but i do think that that's often exaggerated like i'll give you an example of kind of my take on the old testament right so one of the big uh, highlights of the Old Testament is the flood of Noah, right? We've yeah. discussed that many times tonight. Young Earth creation is sort of centered around that to explain geologic shift and things like that. Hmm. Well, the flood of Noah is a very ancient story, very ancient. And even the, the oldest versions of it are very obviously retellings of previous versions of it and recopies of, of more ancient versions. Probably, of it. yeah, yeah. Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah, the flood of Noah is I think story. is the um the oldest one followed by the Atrahasis and then there's it, a it may very well be yeah I think yeah. so it's it's an ancient story the idea that, that this happened that that the gods flooded the world and did all this and judged mankind the the version that we have in the Bible which I believe is in there for a reason I'm a person of faith hmm. is a representation of a very ancient story so I'm not of the opinion that God included that story in the Bible so that we could to learn about history. I do believe there was a flood. I do believe it's a telling of a story that really oh, happened. Could well be. Yeah, sure, sure. It's a very, very elementary retelling of something that's so ancient and so much more complex. And it's not in there for the purpose of a history lesson. It's in there for the spiritual implications. The New Testament writers make it clear time and time again that the entire Old Testament must be re-examined for its spiritual meaning in the light of the things that happened at Calvary. So that was one of the, the disagreements that New Testament theology had with Old Testament theology or that the apostles had with the Jews, is that the Jews prided themselves on their record keeping, their genealogies, their history, and the New Testament authors shifted all of their focus to the allegoric representations of those stories and what they meant in the light of the life of Christ. So the story was always in there from a Christian perspective to represent something about the life of Christ and the children of God. And it was not in there to prove Jewish genealogy. That was a mistaken interpretation from the beginning. So I think people who look at those stories in that light have already gotten off on the wrong foot because those stories are in there to tell us a lesson about Christ and about ourselves. I do believe real events happen that those stories are representative of. But number one, we don't have the details of those events, and those stories are extremely fundamental, lacking all detail almost. And number two, that wouldn't really give us any information about Christianity. It wouldn't give us any information about how to live our life and how to treat others and how to believe spiritual things. It would just simply be a historical account. So that's not the reason that it's in there. I don't look at the Old Testament like a history book, though I do believe it's representative of history in a very fundamental way, like a very elementary way. But I believe that it is in there because it's a type, a shadow, or an allegory of the New Testament. It's but, a, another perspective of the lessons in the New Testament. But, I mean, a lot of different religions have these allegories for the creation of humans and the, the sort of, you know, the way that, that sort of events transpired to create the world or to, to do all of these things. Um, so, and they all differ sort of thing. So, um from from what it sounds like to me, you're sort of saying, "Hey, well, it well, it's allegory." Um, I, I I wouldn't I'm say not saying it's allegory in the sense of I I do believe that events happened which those stories were intended to represent, but well, I don't believe 
number one, that we have the details to really know what happened in those events. And I don't, and I think the reason the details were left out is because that's not the reason the event was recorded. It was recorded because of the allegation. Yeah, no, I get that. But then, then it sort of calls into question, like, is everything allegory? Like you would look at another religious um, origin stories and spiritual stories kind of thing, like maybe the, um, the Aboriginal stories of the rainbow serpent and kangaroo that created humans kind of thing and say hey that isn't that is all allegory there's nothing real in it at all um and so it sort of brings into question is the bible a reliable book for any of this stuff and and did um like when you're talking about these spiritual things happen did that occur at all or is that just allegory as well for the development of humans over multiple years um I think that when when you start to sort of say that that this event didn't actually happen, it's just allegory for something else, and this is allegory for something else, it calls into question, how do you know what's allegory and what's not? How do you know that these things... Because I, I understand that you sort of say faith. Um, to me, that well, that's, isn't... That's not my answer to that question. Okay, so, so how do you tell? Question, yeah, my answer to that question is that the New Testament authors admonished us to re-examine these stories in the light of their spiritual meanings. The reason we do it is because the writers who were truly enlightened, those who existed after the day of Pentecost and Christ himself, instructed us to go back and revisit those stories with this in mind. So we are specifically told to do this. Well, I mean, yeah, they can they can tell you to re-examine it, but that isn't a methodology for finding out what parts of it in, in actuality have happened or or whether these these spiritual stories in fact did happen or whether they did not happen. Sort of so no, the purpose of re examining is simply to take our minds off of that aspect altogether. Um if you look at like like I was saying about the garden, the garden was never about this. And I could prove that in the scriptures. It would take me a little bit of time and patience. But I could prove to any intellectually honest person's satisfaction that the story of the garden was not about this version of man. So when we're speaking of did it happen, yes, it happened, but it didn't happen to this. It was not about this. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, like, and I, I get you, you're saying that, that, that you, 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 you know, under, under interpretation of the Bible, and, and the one that you feel is the most accurate interpretation is that um, it, it's a spiritual plane that it's describing, not not sort of a, a earthly plane, uh, sort of the, you know, like like the beast that you were talking about. I, I get all of that. But you're still claiming something has ontologically happened in reality, right? You're still claiming that a, a um, higher form of being was placed in a earthly body kind of thing or, or a fleshly body or a beastly body or however you want to describe it. Um, what I'm saying is how do you know that your interpretation is not also just a, a allegory for something else? How do you know that actually happened in reality? If all of these other stories are allegory, how do you know that isn't as well? You're speaking of tiers of allegory, is that correct? Well, no. I mean, it might, like, what I'm saying is, if, if, you, if you have no process to determine what's allegory and what's reality, then it could well be all allegory and, and no reality at all. I think there's a misunderstanding here. I may have misrepresented it a little okay, bit. Okay, well, well um, yeah, explain I, I didn't mean to give the impression that the flood of Noah was an allegory. I believe the flood of Noah really happened. I believe that uh, you know the Israelites' wilderness wandering really happened. But I don't believe the fact that it happened is the reason that it's in there. The New Testament authors never contest that it happened. We're never instructed in the New Testament to believe that it didn't happen. But we are instructed to go back and revisit it for a spiritual meaning of what it represented rather than the fact that it happened, which is the way that the Jews had been looking at it all that time. So it's not to turn the stories into allegories. They really happen, but it's to take allegorical meanings from the stories, which is the reason they were truly recorded. But, but some parts of that story, at least some parts and, and others, like you're sort of saying the, the um, um, some stories in it are allegorical, like sort of. Um... I think that's where you're losing me at because I'm not okay. trying to suggest anything in there didn't happen i'm not suggesting that you know, i believe that every story i want to bring up that, that might bridge this if yeah, it's please. okay christian yeah, please okay so behind the scenes partly why i you know confronted christian with my perspective on it and tying this into the flood and the age of the people 
let's look at Methuselah, who's the oldest person according to the Bible, if you believe years or years. Um, his name also means, I believe, if you sound it out, his death shall bring. And he, so imagine naming a kid, his death shall bring. And then the year that Methuselah dies is the year that the flood comes. Okay. So his death shall bring the flood in essence. Okay. The idea that he's the oldest person in the Bible portrays an essence of God's way of prolonging judgment, of being patient in judgment. So there's little tiny aspects of scripture, Mark, where there where you can read into it that kind of hints at the essence of the message. Okay, well I, I don't I don't really see what that got to do with anything. But but really I, I, I guess that I wanna I wanna sort of talk about it. So let's take the flood for instance, right? You're sort of saying, hey, it's based upon an actual event that happened. And yeah, I, I certainly couldn't say, hey, you know, there was no flood, because floods happen all the time. But sure. n it wouldn't have been a global flood, which I think that you you've sort of acknowledged. And that the, the older stories like the Atrahasis and the Epic of Gilgamesh don't have some of the more fantastical elements in them, like every animal on earth is put aboard the ark. And, you know, it is a local flood, I believe, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, or, or at least a land-wide flood, not a worldwide flood. Um, that some of the things in there have got to be allegorical. They've got to be sort of hyperbole, like building a boat of X amount of size and, you know, taking every animal on board from Earth, like every single animal, um, the, 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 they have to be, if, if you're going to look at them like it's a story um, and, and match it up with the Atrahasis and Epic of Gilgamesh, they are things added later that, that sort of are, are embellishments. They're not, they didn't actually happen in, in reality. So what I'm asking is you, you've obviously sort of, how do, you, how do you then go about telling what actually happened in reality and what didn't? And if you're claiming that sort of these spiritual beings were put in a beastly body, how do we tell whether that's not all allegorical as well? Okay, that's a good question. So it's, I'm not, as a minister and an evangelist, I'm not really in the business of persuading people about the historical relevance one way or the other. There, there are some people in the Christian circles who have made that their business, and that's their prerogative, and I've seen some very good and some very bad studies done on that. That's not really anything that I'm particularly interested in. Um, so, I feel like... The, I'm sorry to interrupt, ahead. Christian. Do, like, I, I really got to know this. Do you actually care whether those events happened in reality, or do you just, it doesn't concern you? That's an interesting way to phrase the question, because... Like I said a minute ago, I believe that we can say scripturally that they are intended to be understood as events that happened. But when you ask me if I care, no, yeah. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess um, I do. I, I, I definitely do. I, I care whether those events are things that actually happened. Um, just to, I, I would care if if the, the Greek myths are true and, and, you know, Zeus created somebody out of, out of clay kind of thing. Now I would, I would care if that was the case. No, I understand that. I mean, that's a, that's a very reasonable thing. I think most people would care. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say this. It, it seems strange to me because the, when we're speaking of the Bible, like I said a minute ago, we're speaking of a position of authority, people who have had a personal experience with the spirit of God, who accept the position of authority, it's not a logical thing because it's not a scientific endeavor. You know, we're not depending upon human reasoning to bring us to this position. We're depending on uh, what you would consider a subjective experience to give credence to the authority of this writing. Okay. So when I'm looking at like the, the Noah's boat, for instance, you know, you mentioned the cubits and the size. And everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those numbers, I don't have time to go into all the details now, but all of those numbers are representative of something that had to do with Calvary. You know, even Jesus having the spear thrust into his side was sort of a revelational truth of what happened when the Ark of the Door was opened. So all of those things, his body being the true Ark of Moses, which the Ark of Noah represented riding over the wrath of God, which shows the raptured church and the Jews and the tribulation period and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot that goes into that. But my point is, all of those things are representative of spiritual things. So I don't even have that much interest in the history of it. It just doesn't interest me at all. And I don't think that the New Testament authors 
want it to interest me. They seem to be more concerned with the spiritual revelation of it. Uh, let me let me take a few comments real quick before we pick back up because I've missed a few. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, Big Bad Mama, let me scroll up a little bit. Big Bad Mama asked the question, is Revelation an allegory or is it literal? So the book of Revelation, uh, it, it would take a lot of theology to answer that question, Big Bad Mama, but the book of Revelation exists on three levels, which Paul the Apostle considered first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. And the book of Revelation is happening on all three of those levels simultaneously. And every time something happens in the book of Revelation, especially when you get to the fourth chapter forward, it's happening simultaneously on three different levels, which are natural, physical, and spiritual. Natural, which Paul called the first heaven, is the world around us, the physical world. Physical, the second dimension, is the human body, all the symbolic representations that are in the human body. And then the third dimension, of course, spiritual is the inner man or the holy place. You know, you have the outer courts, the inner courts, and the holy of holies. All these things, one, two, threes, are all throughout the scriptures. So when you're speaking in the book of Revelation, when you get to the fourth chapter forward, everything that happens happens on all three of those levels simultaneously. So I'll give you an example. When John is caught up in Revelation chapter one and uh, chapter four, verse one and verse two, which is the rapture of the church, which happens just before the tribulation period, which is shown in Enoch by its type. When John is caught up to the throne room, when he goes through the open door, what he one of the first events that he sees is the opening of the first seal. Well, three things happened on three different levels when that was open. In the earth, the Antichrist reveals himself and makes a peace covenant centered around Israel. In the realm that John is in, which we're going to call the throne room because I don't have time to go into all this, but in that middle realm that John is in, he sees the first seal open and he sees a white horse rider prevail and he has a, he's given a crown and he goes forth conquering him to conquer. And then when John looks up and he says, I saw a great woe in heaven, the dragon was cast out and he wrapped his tail around a third part of the stars. In that third dimension, that true spiritual dimension, Lucifer is cast out of that heaven of heavens. And it says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. So all of these things are happening simultaneously in all three heavens or on all three dimensions. So that's really, even that question doesn't fully encapsulate how large of a subject that is. Anyways, please go ahead, Mark. I don't need to cut you off. No, no, that, that's fine. That's fine. No, I, I, you know, I'm not the only person here. Um, it's just when you sort of say, hey, it's not logical, it, it kind of, I, I guess from my perspective, it, it's kind of hard for me to, to progress down that path because um, when you're sort of saying, hey, it's not logical, well, rationality is built, built upon logic. So to me, when you're sort of saying, hey, I don't I don't use logic to come to, to this um, conclusion, to me, it's sort of you're sort of saying, hey, I, I'm being irrational. To me, yeah, that's I what mean, it says to me. Well, um, that's a perfectly reasonable interpretation. I mean, I don't have any contest with that. I mean, I, I think me and you spoke of this before. Yeah, I am very self-aware of the suspension of my own reasoning. It's a, it's a choice that I make, which you could say is of reasoning in itself. But, like, I believe that Jesus literally walked on water. I don't think the fact that that happened matters. I think what it represents spiritually is what matters. Mm. But I do think it actually happened, and that's a very unscientific thing to believe. Well, Mark, I have a question for you. Sure, sure. Mark and Odd uh, Christian. Uh, here's a guy, Michael Jones. He, he's a spire philosophy. You ever heard of him? Uh, sorry, I'm Michael having a lot Jones. of trouble hearing you. What was that? Oh, you ever heard of Michael Jones? Michael Jones, is that uh, inspiring philosophy? Yeah. I'll be right back in just a second, guys. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of him. I... He, believes, he believes Adam and Eve were real, but God used evolution to create them. We think that. Adam and Eve were real. Yeah, see, I mean, that, that, there's problems there with sort of what we know about genetics, or there's problems fitting the scientific paradigm because what you've got is is a a genetic lineage that um yes we have a mitochondrial eve which is the the last woman for all of our our sort of mitochondrial dna to be traced to but there were other women around at the time like that doesn't mean that was the only woman it's just what we call it and there is a y chromosome adam but that was like way further back than the eve um and from the genetics, we, we don't see humans dropping below. There was a bottleneck of about 6,000 people um, at one point um, in, in the lineage, and we can sort of tell from the genetic 
information that there was a bottleneck where there was problems of our genetic code becoming too similar to one another, basically inbreeding, too much inbreeding. Um, but that bottleneck never fell below 6,000. So I, 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 it's kind of this, well, if you're meaning it in a metaphorical or, or, or somehow a spiritual sense or one of these things, okay, I, I mean, I'm not sure what to make of that, but okay. But um, when, when we get into whether this happened in actuality, it doesn't seem like it's got a lot of foundation to stand on sort of scientifically. Uh, Mark, he believes that this body, but he believes God used evolution to uh, create animals. To create animals. A Adam and Eve. Oh, evolution to create Adam and Eve. So were there other humans around at the time? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say to that. I, 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 I don't think so. I mean... Um, as I said, if you, if you take Y chromosome Adam, like every, it, so, so we can trace back the Y chromosome because it, you know, obviously it only, only exists in men to a man that every man today is related to, right? We can trace that back. Um, we can trace back the mitochondrial DNA in, in the woman, cause that's passed on from woman to woman back to one single female that we're all related to. Um, they live at different times, like by, oh, I can't remember how, how far apart they are. I can, I can look it up though. Yeah. Uh, nobody believes, you believe that the second Genesis is sequel to the first Genesis? Well, yeah, I mean, ever heard of something like well, uh, I mean, they both, they both have a creation story in them. I believe they're slightly dissimilar. I mean, I've heard a lot of reasons for that, but, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I don't know what to say to that. A sequel. Yeah, like the first part, of the first Genesis said that God created man and woman. Then the second one, it talked about creating Adam. But not creating, he doesn't believe animals create, but from probably like evolution. Okay. And then that rib thing, was it little? It was just uh, God saying, Adam and Eve are equal. Or something like that. It's been a while since I've seen it, but what do you think of that? Uh I I don't I don't you know, He's so not a Christian. Well yeah, so I mean I don't see why there has to be an Adam and Eve. Um if you if you're looking from a purely biological standpoint, that's that's a genetic bottleneck if ever there was one. Just one one man and one woman. Um I, I don't know sort of as a sequel, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I subscribe to evolution, so I think that um, sort of the the genus Homo sort of came from the sort of more basal forms, Australopithecines, um, to... to uh, he believes that too. I'm sorry? Hey, Aiden. Uh, he believes that too. Okay. Hey, let me take a second. Hey, Aiden. Just to press Aiden real quick. Hi, Aiden. Hey, Aiden. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Hey, man. How's it going, Aiden? I'm all right. Hope everybody's doing all right. Uh, yeah. Glad to hear Scooby's okay. We're Thank you, okay. Pete Down. I appreciate that a yeah. lot, man. Yeah. Me he's, too. Uh, he's, Scooby he's Down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's prayers he's were answered. Through, so. Hey, it's I mean, proof. Tell Mark Reed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I hate to I hate to say it, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be dishonest. It doesn't make me. Doesn't mean that they were answered necessarily, P Town. That's all I'm gonna say on that. That doesn't mean I'm any not any less grateful for how things turned out, or the way that uh, yeah. things were definitely not as bad as they could have been, as far as I was concerned. So uh, he's he's resting up in the in the veterinary hospital right now, and uh, apparently oh, that's... Brianna, she came in when I finished up my work. She came in with an update. And, uh, Apparently his temperature is going down and things are starting to look pretty good for him at this point. That's so. good. Oh, that's good. Hey, hey, yeah. That's all this. Mark, Mark that Reed sings a really good Scooby Doo. Oh, I want to know. What's the diagnosis? It's got an Australian twang to it. Uh, okay. Um, the the diagnosis, Dustin, was basically it was probably it was probably something that he ate. It was uh. The likely candidate, unfortunately, is just him being uh, 
a little rascal, so to speak, and eating the little pieces of poop every opportunity he gets when we're not watching him for two seconds while we're walking. I we'll go for two seconds looking at each other, and next thing you know, he's face first into it. So I, we're I, thinking I, that he might have gotten some worms or I something. I dread Sorry, to think ahead. what um vets find in animal stomachs, hey, when they when they have to, you know. Uh, see why they're sick kind of thing you know and i wonder i wonder what the weirdest thing they found in an animal stuff you know because because they eat all kinds of random stuff you know if i was a little bit braver i'd probably ask the veteran uh veterinarian now that you mentioned that but i don't think i'm going to because <laughs> they're, they're pretty Fair slammed enough. over there although I'm some humans not... can be just as silly when it comes to shoving things in their mouth so you know i, I, I don't know if it's just as silly i got a cat addicted to plastic right now it's quite <laughs> ridiculous yeah i mean he's he's 11 years old right so the the possibility of there being uh blockage in him was a real possibility so we ended up doing the x-ray and the blood work and everything and it all came back but sorry i'm not i'm not trying to stall the stream out no, I was going to ask okay. if you had any thoughts on the discussion. Hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I've uh, I've been listening to little bits and pieces here. Uh, probably not the best uh, example of my workmanship while I'm on the job, but I guess that's uh, that's me. Anyway, uh, from what I have been able to hear, yeah, as, as far as what Mark is arguing in terms of there being uh, bottlenecks in uh, human development and population, we typically observe that there is about, at the very, very least, uh, about a thousand people at the very lowest estimate that existed about, I think it's like maybe 60 or 70,000 years ago or something like It was the Toba supervolcanic eruption was what it was called. It right, was, right. It was yeah. a massive environmental catastrophe mm. that reduced what was already a fairly small population of humans down to an extremely small population on the very low estimate and even the high estimate i think is it about like i think it's like fifteen thousand or something like that at the very most so yeah there's definitely a point in time where we were very limited in our numbers and our genetics were definitely affected by that but i don't think there's ever been a single example that we've been able to observe where there's only been two people that have ever existed at any given point in time and i think that the genetic implications of something like that would be very very drastically different from what we currently observe within the human genome right now look i don't, I don't want to speak for christian pike but i don't think we're geneticists I oh mean, god I, I've, no. heard, I've heard a lot of this like i mean sft he's he's big into the genetic stuff you know and well, i think i've heard johnny's not a geneticist either that's the important thing to understand he's not a geneticist. Right, well, either are you, you guys sure. too. I mean, no, so, I know. We'll happily you know, say I'm, that. A, I'm not a geneticist. I'm a layman at best. Sure. So, I mean, I, I hear the same arguments for both sides, and I, I'm not going to look into the matter. I mean, I just don't have time to be a, ge a geneticist. No, not many people. Do. But I hear the same, the same point is used for both sides. Well, the the funny thing about Donnie like is he'll point to a paper, and one of his favorite papers is sort of switching sides, how endogenous retroviruses mutated to become beneficial for humanity. And he'll point that out and sort of say, look, that's evidence of God's design. And I'm not sure how he reaches that conclusion that evolution isn't true, because the paper itself says that evolution is true and that endogenous retroviruses have been co-opted through mutation to be beneficial to humans so I, i'm not sure how he gets there well you you want to look at the actual data why not you're not a scientist projected from that's not the whole what's point. projected from the data like how can you look at the like data you when you're not you a have, geneticist you look, ignore so the conclusions of actual I know it's geneticists hard for you to do, but put yourself in the young earth creation <laughs> bible believe in well i, I don't have, eat in shoes mark yeah it's a giant conspiracy. We're going to look at the actual data and not what the enemy is presenting. Well, but that would be like me as not a Christian or a, or a, the a theologian put myself and say, hey, this is what the Bible actually means when it says this, and this is what you should believe it means. Um, no, instead I ask what, you know, what's your, that's why I'm asking Christian, what's the interpretation that he has? Because I'm not somebody that's supposed to evaluate that. But he's basically saying, well, I'm going to ignore the conclusions this geneticist has made, yet I'm going to use the paper that they have produced 
saying their conclusions to pick out of it what I want to believe and then basically say, hey, that's what the paper says. That isn't what the paper says. And if you're not a geneticist, why are you doing that? Well, here's a simple, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to stem off too far, but what I do is I'm going to take a standard population generator and just put in eight people at the time of when Noah's flood happened. Right. I mean, and, and, and run sure. it and it, and it somewhat matches I'd like to, quite frankly to what, you know, again, you have to count the, there are variables that play according to scripture with the age of the people, you know, they were living a lot longer in the beginning, but the, the population generator matches population that we have today. What, including all of the population sort of that dies in wars and things like that? Have you accounted for all variables or have you just said, hey, I'm going to plug in? Because human human growth, like you can give an average whoa, whoa. human growth, but it's not sort of been that way consistently. Like you don't get that growth that consistent. It does go up, it goes down, there's plagues, there's wars, there's there's things that drop the population, then it climbs back up. Like you're sort of taking a really, really simplistic model and saying, well, yeah, that backs up my side. I, I don't think that's reasonable. And I also don't think it's reasonable that eight people, um, I mean, the, the Tower of Babel is supposed to be a hundred and something years after that event. And I don't think it's reasonable to think that eight people multiplied to a, to a point where they could build the Tower of Babel um a hundred odd years later um i also don't think it's it's very um reasonable to think that 300 and something late years later that there's you know the akkadian empire was formed um sargon of akkad uh, uh empire that was like over a million people well, we, we can go on all day with the things that you don't think sure but well i don't think it's reasonable um, the simple well, pop, but i think i think setting a foundation of a simple population generator encompasses those things of people dying in plague and dying in war and and is a good foundational way of measuring our knowledge of things well let me let anything wrong dustin, with it i mean if you let dustin, hey, can can i yeah. get an objection here sure go ahead dustin please so mark what you're saying is that genetics is so complicated that it takes a specialist to interpret the data. Sure. I mean, I, I don't understand the point of a field where you have to have a guru walk you through what what means what. Really? Do you do you fix your own network and computer? Well, I mean, when I was growing up, when things were a little bit more simple, I certainly could. Do you do I it mean, now? Do you I, fix your you know, network? Do you like, you know, go and when there's a problem with the server up, say, you know, in your um, your ISP end, your service provider end, do you go and fix the server there? You're asking me a technical question about uh, yeah. equipment that doesn't belong to me. Yeah, because I mean, because I, I, I could fix it. I would go in and, right? and that's my field. I cause, could because what you're asking, what you're asking me, what you're asking me to do is, is pull open a computer, get into some kind of a of a, of a script writing program, uh -huh. right? Track down the problem, uh -huh. right? I mean, if it was a technician issue, then yeah, I probably could use uh, one of those little multimeters, find which part was overheated, and replace it, right? Or I could find. Could the you? data point in the the bus line that has the issue, and then fix the code so that it will reroute the data back to its original bus line. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is technical, yeah, but it's not impossible. You know, a person with lay information could probably fix a lot of those problems you're talking about. And what if it was software based? What if it was a corruption in the registry of the system? Then I would have to have a backbone on the source code, wouldn't I? I would have to have someone who knows the original source code so I could reboot the system. Well, no, what you'd I do mean, is you'd get in a specialist because they know what they're doing is really the point that I'm trying to make. Isn't that what I just said? Yeah. 
So the, the reason why is because we can't learn everything about all fields. We can't. It's impossible. And then sort of what I'm trying to get across to you is even though that was my field before I started doing YouTube and stuff, like I, I, I could probably fix a server from an ISP, but that's because I was trained that we can't, like I, I wouldn't know how to fix a car, right? I'm, I'm useless with cars. I've got no idea how they work, okay? I've got, I would be absolutely and utterly useless in that sphere, Except if it was dealing with some of the, the software, maybe I could figure it out. It, it's irrelevant, right? The whole point is... Wait, 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 wait. Are you... Are you can I please tell finish? Tell me you're no can, longer can working? Can I please finish? Can I please... YouTube? Can, can I finish? Can I finish? Well, we get it. Like, you're sure, Mark. We get it. No, no, no. I'm just saying like... that's what I studied before I came on to you. It, it's kind of irrelevant, P-Town. I don't see are how... Are you retired now? No, no, I'm not. No. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I just don't have, uh, look, I, I was studying, look, I've, that's my field, okay, that's what I worked in. I worked on IT on phones for many, many, many years, okay, so what I'm doing is irrelevant. The whole point is I had a field, okay, other people have fields, they specialize in them because it is impossible to specialize in every field, and when somebody comes to me and sort of says, hey, I demilitarized my core server kind of thing. I put it in the demilitarized zone. I'm going to go, are you crazy? Because that I know from what I've studied and what, what my field is, is, is doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That is something that I'm confident on kind of thing. Um, so um, when, when somebody has studied for decades in genetics and things like that, me coming in and sort of saying, hey, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. It's kind of the same thing. It's why we go to doctors instead of try to, you know, fix our own ailments. We've got to rely on people that are specialized in that field. So when I'm sort of saying this stuff about genetic information, I'm not saying, hey, because I'm saying it, you should listen. What I'm saying is that the scientists that work in that field, they're probably going to have a way more chance of being right and they've proven that they're correct to others in their field than just some person off the internet. Okay, Mark, but here's, here's the other end of that yeah. problem. If you're in a special elite group of people that have a special elite form of knowledge that takes another special elite group of people with another special elite form of knowledge to understand each other, how does that help the common man? And furthermore, how does that go to prove anything? Um, it, it's not to understand each other. It's to understand the, the, the science that they're putting down. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm pushing really back hard against your idea that just because somebody has knowledge of a field, they're a guru. Like you wouldn't say, oh, well, I went to see the doctor the other day. And then, you know, Dustin, you might pipe up and say, hey, why are you trusting this guru? You know, that, that's kind of the level that we're on at the moment. Like, you wouldn't describe somebody who's knowledgeable in their field as a guru. I'm wondering why you're doing it to geneticists. I'm doing it to geneticists yeah. because it's kind of a buku field where you have to have maybe five years of entry college uh, education yeah. to understand the basics. Well, same with medicine. I mean, but... So, but the, the other end of the equation is, is that there are some people like Donnie who take the time to read the papers and feel like it's worth their time to try and understand sure. these things. And you're saying that it's not worth the time or, or, or maybe I'm misreading. No, the no. other end of the equation is that if he's getting it wrong yeah. and you clearly see the issue, maybe he is stubborn enough not to listen to you, but maybe you could describe it to me. I would take a shot at trying to explain it to Donnie if you explain it to me in a way that I understood it. But as of to date, I still don't understand what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could certainly sort of um, do something. Can I jump in for just a second more? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I just wanted to clarify for the sake of the audience, because all Mark is saying is that it, it's very obvious that something like genetics requires a specialist to interpret it no different than extreme coding or you know i build tile floors you know you have to have a tile specialist to tell you what to do yeah, with I, shower, I wouldn't be able know? to do it's, that yeah no I, yeah people yeah. who work in fields for years and years and accrue knowledge know more than people who don't do that and so genetics is such a huge scientific discipline and such a huge broad endeavor 
that it's to say that it's a guru thing. I understand the reservation of saying, hey, we can get to the point where the dad is so disconnected from the common man that we are more or less just taking their word for it. But I, to jump to that so quickly is a bit, it's just kind of counterintuitive because like Mark said, you know, when you have a disease, you go to the hospital because they study diseases. That's what they do. You know, it's a person has the right to go and learn genetics for themselves if they're that interested in understanding the data, if that's what they're going to do. But it's kind of like one of the disputes that he had with P-Town earlier in the stream. If we're not going to educate ourselves and we're making no bones about that, then why do we have such dogmatic positions about this? You know, how can we have such strong dogmatic positions one way or the other if we're admitting that we don't even know what we're talking about? So Mark is being very reasonable here. Thank you. And look, and, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, if, if, if what I said about genetics disagreed with the geneticist, I would absolutely defer to their, exp I would say, hey, they know a lot more than I do, right? Um, I might, you know, sort of back up my position with what a geneticist has said, find a paper and things like that. And that's not hard to do. But one thing I wouldn't do is take the conclusion of the paper, ignore it, and then say, hey, because they said this in the paper, I'm interpreting it as this thing, right? Because you can always do that with anything that anybody has written. And misinterpretation is a, a, a thing for a reason. I just, I just don't like the idea of taking research, even myself taking research, ignoring the conclusions that the person who has been literally working in that field for most of their life has made and say, well, I'm going to make my own conclusions about it. I'm going to, I'm going to interpret it as I see fit, because I think that leads you down a road of being able to interpret anything in any way. You know, you could read a a, a paper on that one glass of wine, um, you know, makes your heart. I have to object. Better. Two 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 geneticists can look at the same data and come up sure. with different conclusions. That's why scientific consensus yeah, exists. I, I, yeah. I, I, I have to make an objection here, Mark. You yourself, in the very beginning, when you described science, yeah. said, said that a challenge or an objection can come from anywhere. Yes. But, but now you're making the case that it's silly for someone who's outside of their league to make a challenge to someone who, like I'm going to refer right. to again, is sort of a guru. I mean, you got, you got to, at some level, you got to see what I'm pointing to, well, uh, right? I'm not necessarily harping on you and yeah. trying to say that you're wrong, but there, there is an issue, fundamentally, a circle in your logic. No, no, it's not. Uh, and the reason why is because a challenge can come from anywhere for science, but it has to pass through the rigors of the scientific system, the, the, the process that we have in order to displace that knowledge. For instance, you know, Einstein was was really revolutionary and really buckled the scientific trend. He had to go through the motions of publishing a paper, doing the maths, doing the homework, publishing it, getting it peer reviewed. Um, same with, say, uh, Mary Schweitzer recently, who showed that dinosaur um, soft tissue like collagen can actually last under the circumstance way longer than we, we originally thought. That was sort of um, um, something that, that the scientific community didn't accept. She published and demonstrated exactly how she could prove that. And then the, the, the science has changed. It's changed forever. We, we now have changed our understanding. Well, I mean, you're, the understanding of that is under the presumption that they are that old. What do you mean? That's the foundational presumption is that, I mean, the consensus of that well, she, she is said that, that, that with that are millions of years old. You, she said that that, that you make a very good, in order for you make an public. interesting point there. Well, she said that with that old P town. It's not well, like she was saying for her. Yeah. She wasn't saying that the earth was you, younger. If, she was, if she came out and if she came out to say that because she discovered that this collagen, there's a blood, it, it's still it existing. Therefore, the whole entire paradigm of the scientific community is wrong 
everything is way younger than it is, she would never have gotten published. Okay, but how can you tell point. that? Because she came out and definitively oh, stated yeah. that she didn't believe the Earth was young, that young Earth creationists were misrepresenting her, misrepresenting her paper, and you want to make a conspiracy that she was afraid to come out and, and sort of say that, that oh, it's the Earth's really young. So let me let me explain what Well, let's actually, look at the data well, here. You have town. blood. Come on, man. You believe blood P -town. and college. P-Town, please, of years. please, P-Town, can belief. I please speak? Like, you just jumped in over the top of me. Let's have some respect and sort of, you know, let each other finish before we sort We're of jump in. I respected you for an hour and a half, Mark. So go I on. mean, you're kind of gish galloping them, though, at the same time when you suddenly bring up, oh, well, you think that bones and collagen exist for millions of years on top of what we're trying to explain. Well, I don't know before. Gish gallop there. Means well, it, it wasn't so blood. There was no blood. It was collagen, and she had to bathe it in acid for a really long time in order to get anything from it. Like, there was a process she used. Um, but it did show, and not blood, not, not blood. There was no blood. Uh, read the paper. No blood, just collagen. Okay, that's it. But they did find proteins. Sure, collagen does contain proteins, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Not only that, but they found pustules. Well, I mean, uh, remnants of, of all kinds of organic structures, sure, but... You know, to say yeah, pustules, all kinds of but, but pustules. But I guess I'm getting across that nothing pointed to a young Earth. What it pointed to is that under certain conditions, <laughs> and this is her conclusions that under certain conditions, soft tissue like collagen can um um can can preserve longer than we originally thought. Okay, that that's it. That was the limit of her conclusions. And she doesn't think that the Earth is young. She never said her paper showed that the Earth is young. There's nothing to suggest that. And people are misrepresenting her, which is why they had to put a disclaimer on her paper to say, stop saying this. And people like P-Town, as he's just showed, still mm. haven't stopped saying this, which is ridiculous. I did. I haven't spoken for her. You're okay, putting words we, in my mouth. Did you just say that she was second? afraid to Neutral speak corners. up? Like, didn't you I'm just say that? Data. Neutral. I'm, saying, I'm trying to point uh. out how you can have data. There's data. What we know is, is that there's proteins and collagen in these bones. And my, my presumption would be, oh, they're a lot younger, therefore. These bones are a lot younger than we suppose. And your conclusion is, along with the secular field, is, is going to be that, oh, it looks like the, along with these the author. proteins can last millions of years. Along with the author. Yeah, sorry, Christian, I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to jump in. Yeah, Christian, Christian needs to, to go. So, yeah, sorry. Real quick, real quick, guys. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt. I know you guys are carrying on. I wanted to check first off and see if Father Charles is here because I have to go pretty soon, and I certainly don't want to leave without a moderator present. So, Father Chuck, if you are here, please let me know. Uh, and if you don't let me know, then I'll try to hang out until you can let me know because I don't want to leave us without a moderator. I certainly don't want to end the stream if folks are talking. Um, but I do want to say this. First and foremost, I appreciate everybody coming, you know, in the panel and in the chat. Like, seriously, I really do. I look forward to these broadcasts. Brother Chuck has been very, very gracious to allow me to use his channel. And I hope that I can do something to help him build his channel to repay him. So I appreciate you guys coming out. I hope that you'll invite people and share the streams and stuff. Um, the original topic was whether or not conservative Christians should embrace uh, the realities of a Darwinian worldview and, and the explanations of biodiversity. So if there are any more questions on topic or any more comments on topic before I go, I'd like a chance to address those. Uh, I would also like a chance to uh, encourage our panel members to be civil and remember that this is a Christian broadcast and it's a virtuous broadcast. So let's treat each other like brothers. I know that we will. Um, I know that a lot of people uh, in these circles uh, especially in the YEC circles that sort of orbit around Kent Hovind, think of a lot of the points that I'm making as being controversial, even as, you know, P-Town had mentioned his perception of the points earlier. I would like to challenge that. Uh, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that the Bible does not explicitly forbid us from, from you know, seeing the, the Darwinian realities of biodiversity. I don't think that's in the scripture. I don't think it's forbidden. And I do think it's obviously true. So if there's anything else on topic, I'd like to address it. Other than that, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate us trying to be civil because a lot of times these streams get to being very ugly, and we don't want that. But please carry on, Mark. 
um oh i was i was gonna ask you something oh, go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead no please go ahead no, go for it go for it um I, I had mentioned something to you earlier about uh, the Pachycetus yes. and its uh, evolutionary morphological change into the blue whale. And you had said earlier, and correct me if I'm wrong at any point if I misquote you here, but I believe you said something to the effect that you could accept that the Pachycetus did in fact experience morphological change where it did become later on in time this blue whale that we observe today. Is it, that seems, it seems to be very obvious that mammals did not begin in the water. And I don't see any reason in the scriptures explicitly to forbid that. So it, it wouldn't cross my theology one way or the other if I did accept that. Um, well, I guess my, the thing I was going to follow up with was you were saying... What about earlier, dolphins? Well, can I, can I finish what I was saying, Dustin? Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I just that that just bursted out of my head. No, no it's all I'll good. I'll come back to you, Dustin, as soon as you get finished. I promise. Yeah, seriously. Um, you will get your opportunity. Don't worry, Dustin. But um, the point that I was going to follow up with was you had referred earlier to different kinds and how the scripture refers to different kinds, like the beasts of the field and the fishes and the fowl and yes. things like that. Um, I would say that a morphological change which takes place where an entirely land-dwelling animal, that being a pachycetus, experiencing such morphological change that it now becomes an exclusively ocean-dwelling creature. As a matter of fact, the Bible explicitly says that whales are fishes. They are within the category of the fish kind, so to speak. I don't I think just don't... that, but I understand what you're saying. I do think it does. Count. And you know what? I, I will have to look in. Like I said, I just got off work, but I'm sure I can look more into that as far as definitive proof that the, the scripture does say that or not, if, it, if I'm incorrect about that. but There is I, an instance where it refers to a whale as a fish, if that's what you're referring to. Yeah, well, I, I'm pretty sure, given the kinds that we're talking about uh, that are laid out in the Bible, that that would label it within that category and it just seems that i disagree with that we can go into that if we want if not you can just keep trucking i i, I just i don't know i guess that yeah if you want to get if you want to get more into depth about your disagreement about that sure because that's kind of the basis of what i was trying to get into with you here because i and and maybe i'm wrong i'd, I'd really like to, you to embellish on it but i just feel like what you said earlier about there being different kinds kind of gets not necessarily overturned, but I think it gets stretched even further than you're necessarily even willing to stretch it in terms of that kind of fundamentally drastic morphological change that you see from one sort of phenotype to another. Could I add? No, that's, I mean, that's one of the, the biggest examples. I'll give, I'll give me just sure, a second. Thank you. That's, that's one of the biggest examples that a lot of uh, young earth creationists get challenged with and creationists generally is because that is so well documented and the transitional fossils are so abundant in relation to that example um the well what i was saying about i wasn't trying to nitpick you it's just in the book of genesis you're laying out the creator of the universe organizing life into categories and then in the instance of jonah you have a writer from his human perspective talking about what happened so it's just a bit of a different caliber when it comes to definition is all right but you're still talking about the word of god though right like he wouldn't allow if it was truly a miscategorization and he made a mistake about that he wouldn't have allowed that to have just gone on and well look, i don't right? think of it as a mistake i just think of it as sort of a colloquial thing he's just saying it's but, a fish but it is a mistake water. though like that is actually a mistake it's not a fish it's a mammal well, do you believe mammal, that he was he was sorry christian do you believe that he was in the ocean in the deep parts of the ocean John? i'm sorry what's the question p-town do you believe that Jonah was in the deep parts of the ocean in this animal? I believe he was he inside of the whale. Okay. And that he could see outside this whale and he saw things. That he could see outside the whale? Well, he describes being about, you know, being between the roots of the mountains and there was seaweed about his head while he was in the deep. I'll, Am I I'd coming to, in clear? I have to go back and look at the verses that you're talking about. To be honest, P Town, I believe. But that, you believe this was a real event, not. Yeah, of course. I've already stated it. that okay. a number of times. Um, um, I'm sorry, I, not even, I, I oh, guess. I ahead, guess my no, my no, no, problem no, no. is that in in the start in Genesis, they, they talk about making 
um, and, and sort of so that the origin story that I think that you're alluding to is creating the different kinds of animals, but the different kinds are animals of the land, then animals of the sea kind of thing. So I, I got to agree with Aidan that I'm finding it hard to understand how your, your sort of kinds work if they're created separately how a, a, no, an, sure, an animal, sure. That's what animal of the that. sea and an animal yeah. of the land can have the same ancestor. No, I mean, that, that's what I was going to address is that that is typically what's in, inferred by that. But I don't think it's explicitly stated in those means. You know, earlier, I don't know if you were here, Mark, but earlier I gave the example of the dolphin and the shark developing very, very similar body types to fill a similar niche. And so, you know, to a lay person who just sees them for the first time, they're going to think this is the same kind of animal, depending on the specific species. And we know that those are right, two very right. different animals who've been shaped that way because they're filling the same niche. Mm -hmm. So when I see the different kinds in the book of Genesis, like when it says the fish of the sea or when it says the fowl of the air, when it says the beast of the field, I don't think that's necessarily a reference to terrestrial versus aquatic versus flying. I think it's more of just a broad categorization of the kinds of animals that we see in the world. Okay. So the dolphin, for instance, like if the dolphin is a descendant of Pachycetus, mm. right? The dolphin has adapted to fill the same niche as a shark. And so morphologically, it's obviously very similar to a shark and they even compete one with the other to fill the same sure, niche. Sure. But still the shark is a fish and the dolphin is a mammal. Mm -hmm. So you still see a stark divide from a creationist perspective. But Aiden is right. The, the transition from Pachycetus to aquatic mammals is a staggering transition, and it's one of the reasons that I believe in radical morphological change because it's so obvious. So I think it's good that Aiden brings it up, and I would actually question other creationists, what scriptures do you use not to believe that? And I, I, I don't mean to say that in an arrogant way because it is radical, and it's the kind of thing that even takes me aback before I have a chance to think about it, which is, I think, why Aiden brought it up. But you know, once I stop to consider, I don't really have a problem with that because that dolphin is still radically different from that shark, even though they're filling the same niche. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, that that's fine. I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. I, I just, yeah. Justin, didn't you have a question, I believe? Yeah, I asked about, uh, what about dolphins? You said uh, there are no mammals that, that were born in the sea. Created or something like that. Yeah, what about dolphins? Well, that's what we were talking yeah. about is that we believe that the, the mammals who live in the ocean are descended from terrestrial mammals. So what, what Christian's trying no, to I, say? I, I was listening. You you asked me. No, I, I was. I, I got the answer. Okay. You just asked me what my question was. Oh, oh okay. Gotcha, I'm sorry. I'm gotcha. sorry. Okay. Well, I mean. Hey, did you have a chance to finish? Was that? Did you have a chance to finish your thought? I know we all got kind of scrambled. Um. Yeah, I guess I guess the only thing I would say to finish off uh, what what you were talking about earlier was that um, I think when you allow for those sorts of implications um, in terms of morphological change, I just find and I I know that you'll disagree on a scriptural basis, but just in terms of the the paradigm that that kind of establishes with things i don't see how you can allow for that kind of huge morphological change to happen but then you look at something like a chimp and a human and you say well those things can't have a direct common ancestor with one another. well earlier i actually said that i wasn't i wasn't necessarily opposed to that because like i said i don't think of this as being the man that was created i think of this oh. as a beast so right. I, I thought I, that you'd said earlier that it was uh australopithecines was what you said well, I'm, earlier all i was saying was that right now i i feel inclined to be reserved towards that but if i warmed up to that or if i moved my position that's not something that challenges me on a theological level is all that i meant i'm perfectly happy to concede that this is an ape Okay, I've just as I've, in yourself, yeah. yeah. So I, I think this I've, is what heard, Christian um, and I were going through that that he sort of sees humans as being a, a beast that has had something added to it, so it doesn't concern him if that beast is shared with a lot of other um, more basal that's forms correct. kind of thing. And this is where I take a stand and say it's, that's not biblical. Okay, yeah. well, I mean, I I don't. But again, and then, and then we well. Yeah. Well, it is what it is. I'm certainly the outlier here. I understand that. Well, yeah, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't mean it to be rude. I mean, I don't. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know, know about I that. I, I think that most Christians believe in evolution. 
No, I didn't mean that. I know oh, that, uh, here, was, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, you're right. I have returned. Oh, Father Charles. I have returned. <laughs> How are you, buddy? Father Charles. He's back from the dead. Back. <laughs> I knew he'd be back. Well, the, well, this is, well, this is the, from my perspective, Christian, is, it's where you affirm with Mark, but then you don't affirm with me because it's not really that important to you. And that is the consensus amongst most Christians, and they tend to affirm to the worldly ways. And I get it. It's not It's not a required prerequisite for being a Christian. But I think it's immensely important for a lot of other people. Well, and I think it will be to Mark one day. Well, P-Town, you know, um, that's, that's called an appeal to consequences. Right, so if you're sort of whatever, I don't care. Well, it, it, I don't care what, what definition you put well, on. Allow me to explain. So if you're sort of saying, "Hey, it must be true," because if it's not true, it has all these consequences that I don't like. You know, it, it means that that you know, as a result, all of these things would happen, and I'm I'm not really, um, you know, honouring the word of the scripture and all of these things. It, it doesn't make it not true because you don't like the consequences of it being true. Okay, whatever made up term you just used doesn't. I stand with the word of God. Period. I mean, what do you mean made up? That that's not made up. I'm sorry, P Town. Let me let me handle this. That P Town. That's not a made up term. That's that's the real term. It, it's all terms well. Look, you've got up, you've got. Me. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what a pedantic um, way of going about things. Um, but look, <laughs> he's got me there. He's got me by my short know, skinny so, there. So, I can't. I can't. Well, I, can't you know, I, I, I want to. I want to clarify because logical fallacies don't mean necessarily you are incorrect, right? Just because you're sort of uh, somebody says, "Hey, that's a logical fallacy," doesn't mean to say, "Hey, I know that you're incorrect. Everything you say is incorrect because of this thing." No, what it's saying is that um, the, the 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 sort of path of logic that you have used in in what you're saying it, it doesn't follow a logical way you could be completely irrational and still be right about something you know if you've ever heard the adage you know you're not being paranoid if somebody is actually watching you kind of thing right so you could be completely irrational and still be correct about that thing all i'm pointing out is that that what you're saying doesn't really follow logic um and and you can like like you know um um Christians like yeah I don't follow logic to get to this this point. I'm That's not here fine. defending logic. I'm I'm defending the word. I mean okay. I as a Christian I defend the word of God and and I and I do it unwaveringly and Okay. Um and that's because I have other reasons to believe that it's true that far outweigh the other evidence. Yeah, so and the evidence that will be presented like faith. most likely. Well, I, I just want to I just want to no, no, don't can, no, can no, I just put something in here? Like that, Aiden. That's not so fair. P-Town, so I, I get that. And I'm not here to sort of say, hey, you you know, you can't believe that or you can't come to that conclusion based upon those series of, of sort of steps that you're using. What I'm kind of saying to you is that you keep saying that I'm going to believe you. And, and what I'm trying to tell you is that it requires logic and evidence to convince me that what you're saying is true. So this whole idea that you're sort of putting across that you're going to convince me by just telling me this over and over. Um, I, I No, no, I'm, this is mostly for Christian. I mean, in his position, this is where I take a stand. And because... He, well, let me finish. I, I let, mean, let me finish. Scripture clearly you, says, you, you, you like interrupted. I will just a second. Okay. Scripture clearly says that he, he, God formed Adam <laughs> out of the dust of the earth, right? And if he's going to possibly even consider, and he would be okay with something other than that, I haven't. Then said I'm going to say that's. I, I know he hasn't yet, but you hint towards it. No, I didn't. Like it, I said that the man. Maybe that was, I misinterpreted. Oh, All right. You did. The man that was created in the garden <laughs> is not this man, as the scripture clearly teaches. Wait, what? So I, I think that you're getting way away from the scriptures. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat what you said real quick? And then I'll let Mark. Yes, you're, you're implying that this fallen image of sin is the man of God, the image of God that was created in the garden. And the scripture is contrary to that. Am, am I the only one not following? Yes. 
I mean, uh, it wouldn't be the first time. But we had an in-depth conversation about I'm it. So kinda, if you weren't listening to the conversation Christian and, I, a Christian and I had. Let me I, my, my view is simple. Like God made Adam from the dust of the earth. Okay. And if you, you believe that he descended from some other I beast. I said that Adam descended from any beast, Peter, and you're, but, you're putting that but, in. But you, okay, maybe I'm misinterpreting. You, well, you're, no, you're leaving on. it open. You, you leave it you open here. I'm, I'm being very... You did say... You did say earlier that it is possible for Homo erectus or what is it, Homo habilis or Australopithecus. Yeah, to be related uh, with with the, with monkeys or chimpanzees or whatever. I remember you saying something. Share a common ancestor is what what he said. Yeah, yeah. so Dustin, I mean, you're, you're, you're if for, ancestry okay. is tied into creation, I mean, real quick, Dustin. Were you here for the part of the conversation where I explicitly stated the difference in this beast and the true man that's the image of God? I, I, yes, I do remember you mentioning that, but I don't necessarily remember being there for that part of the conversation. Well, that was that was in neither here nor there, neither here nor there. There's not neither here I nor was there. pointing there out. Not. I was pointing out to the mechanism of his observation and his objection which was that you made a concession earlier about ancestry and uh, 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 apes being related. But that's, you know, not, I, not I, I, I can see why I, okay, but I can see why P-Town came at it from that perspective. That's what I was saying. But I mean, I, I, I hate to be rude, but are you guys just not listening to me? I mean, I did. As, no, I, I wasn't, we're, we're I'm trying, not, that's not what trying I did. to follow. You, like, sometimes some of your concessions <laughs> you know make it muddy the water a little bit and it's hard to follow your your perspective on things i do and think... i can understand why p town would want to get clarification from you and i, I what's what's that stifling me is, is, is the huh? okay that. asking questions for clarification is perfectly fine that's not the same thing as supposing what somebody means well i mean i could explain what well, i got from how Christian. do you get how do you get to what somebody means if he doesn't ask you a question, Christian? He didn't ask a question, Dustin. That's the point. He, he, he said what he thought, like he said what Christian was saying. Like, so from my interpretation of what Christian was saying is that, um, I don't know, let's make it an analogy. Let's say that the, the beast is kind of the, the car and the driver got put in the car at the Garden of Eden and the fall. Um, then he considers humans to be that divine representation that was put in there but he acknowledges that it, it is possible and it, it you know sort of concedes that it may be likely that the, the car was had a the sort of common ancestor with all these other things out there right so um he's sort of saying hey the earthly form could have um evolved from other apes However, that's not what he considers him. Is that a fair representation of what you said, Christian? Well, how is this anywhere? Great, actually, the only thing great, you were missing there was the card they were taking. How is this anywhere related to being made in God's image and being formed from the dust of the earth, the way Scripture says? How is this? See, and anywhere? that's that right there is exactly why I understand his confusion. Questions. How is this in anywhere related? I mean, how, I'm going to answer the questions rather than just continually asking them. So the question is, do I concede that Adam descended from ape like creatures? No, nor have I ever conceded that my contest to most creationists is that they consider this the form that Adam was in, which I believe the scripture is very explicit about that is not the form that Adam was in. So it's true that the original man, you can even say the original body of man, because we're speaking of physically glorified bodies. The, the New Testament's full of them. The body that Adam was made of, no doubt, was shaped from the dust of the earth. Whatever God meant by that, there's no doubt that that's true. But mm -hmm. being, mental gymnastics. So you're just so you're just saying. So what you're just saying, brother Pike, is oh, that let's, let's Adam be, was just a monkey's uncle. That's what let's you're just, saying. Let's just be be reasonable. And and monkeys didn't descend from humans. I'm not always a reasonable person, yeah. Mark. I'm sorry. Let me let me finish, Aiden. Hold on. So my point was. Adam is when we say Adam, we're saying the image of God, the original man before the fall. Adam was made in the image of God. 
This that we are in today since the fall is not the image of God. So to say that this is related to a beast is not the same thing as saying that Adam is related to a beast. And the gold medal goes to Christian Pike. The tap dancing queen. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. I mean, th this I is the God way a lot of this the way a lot of Christians think, and I just think it's dangerous. I just think it would over your head. I don't. I don't know why it's <laughs> dangerous as such. What? What? Uh, oh, it, for your faith, I, kind of thing. I can follow what you're saying, you're saying Christian. I, I know, man. I get man. it. Because <laughs> I explained that like probably six times in the stream already. All right. Well, I'm, I don't have a dog in this race, to be honest with you. So you know, I don't. I don't. I, I don't yeah. Um. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do some work which I was supposed to be doing from like the last hour and forty five minutes, which is just terrible. But uh, yeah, so I, I better go do something. But um, thank you so much for having uh, me. On. I really appreciate awesome. it. Um, yeah, and that was that was you're interesting awesome. love, on on your perspective. I'm I'm not sure I'm quite on board. I don't know, and and I I I, I feel like, um, I, it it kind of. I, I don't know. It's just something about sort of, you know, not using um, logic and rationality and stuff that I, I guess I, I, I just cannot get my mind around that. I, I, I guess I'd have to sort of talk with you more and find out what are you using then? And, and if it's faith, then, um, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of questions I have about that. But but I, I really thank you for talking to me and sort of explaining your position. And I've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. I always enjoy that. You're always great. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Mark, you're always respectful. It's always an intellectually stimulating conversation, and there's usually a lot of topics being broached. Well, I, I'm, yeah, this was a I, big, broad discussion. Yeah, yeah, it? absolutely. It was really interesting. Um, And, and I find, like, I, I haven't sort of met your particular theology before, Christian, so it's kind of really fascinating to have sort of something new to sort of, you know, um, um, roll around in my head. I'll probably get some questions and stuff. I'd love if we can we can sort of meet up and discuss them. I'm, I'm more than happy to come on again and we can discuss like all of the implications. Do it. Um. Yeah, but thank you. Do it and record it. I want to see okay. this. Okay. Well, <laughs> apparently, I'm just doing it for the views. So I just take a shot at P Town. I'm way out. So. Um. But and I appreciate that. It. Thank you so I'll much. Um. <laughs> thank you everybody and, and take care i'm gonna actually do mm -hmm. thanks father charles you, take care have, have a nap Watch mate okay. thank thank good you. To you, See ya. thank you for watching liking and subscribing this video and i want to give a big thank you to all the channel members whose support allows me to bring you more content like this in the future thank you so much everyone